the session was called on the program a uh, relationship between uh, uh, radical journalists and the, ma and the mass media, but I notice on the door it says it's called radical journalists working for the mass media. <laughs> Which is a, a slightly different thing. <laughs> However, I'm sure we'll get over it. I think Tom is going to go for it. Yeah, okay. Um, thanks, Tim. Uh, I'm Tom Mills, and uh, I, uh, I work at the University of Bath. And I also co edit a website called New Left Project, which is a kind of, I guess you could call it an alternative media. It's more of a sort of school website for like left wing political analysis. We do stuff on um, the media. And my expertise, if I can set to have any, I guess would be more on the BBC, uh, but I'm obviously not going to talk about that today. Uh, the reason the organisers asked me to speak, I think, was uh, um, a few weeks ago I wrote on this topic for um, the Left Project, um, and I'm not going to talk for very long because I think, you know, we've got a small enough room that we can all just have a pretty informal discussion. So. I suppose I'm just going to chat for five minutes about what that blog post is about and what I think we're, the topic is here today. So, um, as I said earlier, a good slogan to go with was to know the media, be the media, and change the media. So, I guess the starting point, or at least what I would want to talk about, is about knowing the media. What is the media? How does it operate? And what does it mean to be working in the media if you recognise the media for what it is? So, a lot of people have been sort of summarised pretty articulately the problems that you have, which is that most of the media um, is controlled by giant corporations and they're economically dependent on advertisers. And basically, the, the, the fact that they're owned and economically dependent on those best of interest means that the journalistic culture within them is shaped by that environment. And that the, if the working as a journalist in those institutions, you face certain constraints and um, you have to kind of navigate and internalise a lot of the culture um, there. And a lot of journalists, we've got to be honest, are, are not naturally going to be radicals, they're not necessarily going to be um, interested necessarily in, in, like, in, in questioning the system, but it's quite clear also that some media um, is more inclined towards questioning corporate power than others, and some people working within those um, institutions are also um, more inclined to do so. I don't think we have to do that. Start again. Mm -hmm. start? No. No. Okay, <laughs> so um, I guess the strategic question is, how do we, people who are interested in challenging the media, um, understand it and engage with the people who are working in it who might be sympathetic with some of our causes? So. The, the blog post that I wrote on this topic was engaging with um, an activist group called Media Lens who have a certain approach to this issue. And Media Lens um, adopt what's called the propaganda model of um, the free press. I guess a lot of you will be familiar with it. But basically this was developed by um, a political economist called Ed Herman um, in a book he co-authored with Noam Chomsky, who I guess you'll all be familiar with. And the argument is, essentially it's a critique of liberal understandings of the free press in the United States. So it's, the, the model says that certain pressures, which have been mentioned before and I mentioned earlier, ownership, advertising being the, 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 the primary ones, which are, they talk about filters, um, shape the news content in a certain way, and that means that what gets reported tends to reflect the kind of established interest, so, so that that's the model. And a small part of that is the idea that what appears to be a free me media, uh, an a society without any kind of uh, physical coercion is basically able to operate as a sort of de facto propaganda system. And also that a small part of it is this notion of fig leaves, which is the idea that you can operate within the media and you can appear to be critical, or you may even be a radical critical voice, but that it's important for the media to have these voices in order for them to appear that they're, they're creating a sort of balanced debate. So then that creates the question of Strategically speaking, what damage does it do to these, to, um, to let's say, radical movements that, and the kind of change which we'd like to see, to have these people there? Is it damaging the, for people like, let's say, Owen Jones or George Monbiot or Seamus Milne to be writing in these liberal publications and giving the appearance that, you know, all is well and good with the system because we have these alternative voices? So... Um, Essentially, Media Lens's argument is that, uh, that these people do 
by being present in these institutions, disguise the fact that they, um, that they aren't free, and which I think is, is, is correct to an extent. But my argument was that having them there is nevertheless could still be useful to us. So that, that there may be very limited spaces available um, in the corporate media for alternative voices, but it's still useful to have the voices there. Um, the only other thing that I wanted to um, add to that point, because I said I'd be quick, is um, to emphasize the, the theoretical model of the propaganda model, although it's a very useful um, tool, I think, for understanding what the media does, uh, it is, in some ways, there are important parts of the British media which don't fit that comfortably into the model. And there's been a lot of discussion about The Guardian and the limitations of it as a platform, but it's clear that, in some ways, the Guardian differs from other aspects of the corporate media. It has the kind of tradition, uh, the trust was mentioned earlier, um, and ed a slightly different editorial culture that perhaps creates more space, or at least, uh, as we all know from like, reading The Guardian as compared to Times, a certain different editorial culture which um, has a slightly different um, political economy. And the other obvious example of this is the BBC. So um, I guess my argument would be that uh, figlies, if you like, these alternative voices are still useful to us, um, but that we shouldn't have any delusion about what overall the media is, and we certainly shouldn't waste our time um, trying to hope that, that, that media systems, which are clearly uh, don't have uh, the interests of the people of its heart, are going to change in and themselves. Uh, but at the same time, it, we should be uh, supporting critical voices, not necessarily supporting uncritically, but we um, shouldn't waste our time attacking those critical voices um, within the media. And secondly, that I think we can also assume that as our movements strengthen, I think the, uh, the autonomy which some journalists are going to enjoy and the space for critical voices in these organisations are probably going to um, open up for us. So that's all I want to say. Um, and I think Tim's going to talk for a bit. And then hopefully from them we can just sort of talk amongst ourselves about what we think about this issue and, uh, yeah, take things from there. Tim? Than so many people, we've got an occupy, haven't we? Um, I'm going to talk from a, a, a different point of view because um, I'm a journalist, I'm a hack by profession, and I was uh, I worked for radical media, cooperative media, and corporate media over the years. I was trained by corporate media, for which I'm very grateful, and it certainly didn't do me any harm. But um, since we're all saying who we are, I also worked for 20 years for the National Union of Journalists as the editor of their paper. Uh, and I'm sp so I'm presenting now from the point of view of the journalists, uh, all journalists, not just radical journalists. Because I think, uh, first I, want, I think we should challenge this, the stereotype that says that mass media are all reactionary and radical media are all revolutionary. As far as we're concerned, as far as journalists are concerned, they're just journalists, and the difference between them is not even their ideology, which does vary, but the conditions under which they work, the circumstances of the production that they're in. And we've had this very good evidence in the last couple of weeks, uh, thanks to a right-wing Tory called Peter Oborn, about the commercial pressures uh, that big media operate under. By the way, the last, the last answer that uh, Donica gave... Uh, uh, when he, he produced this new formula for a definition uh, of corporate media, we, we just call them big media, which is a lot shorter. <laughs> like big pharma and big oil, just big media. We've actually got this book that I will promote now called Big Media and Internet Titles, which is on sale um, at, at the stall outside. So um, the, 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 the pressures that the journalists come under, I think we understand from that. And by the way, it's not only the Telegraph. Um, the, the, the wonder, wonderful sainted guardian that um, Tom mentioned, pursuing its, um, its, its, its dedicated policy of not charging for online material, is entering into absolutely scandalous commercial relationships with big advertisers, but under disguise. I mean, it's kind of like fake grassroots stuff. They've got this thing called Guardian Labs, which is funded by the Unilever Food Corporation, which produces sponsored editorial. It's only online, not in the paper. And it's supposedly innovative world for sustaining sustainable development. It's got some, some slogan like that, but it's actually paid for content. 
and it might be an interesting argument to have whether that is a better thing than people paying for a subscription for the website. You know, it works for the Guardian, it brings in lots of money and it guarantees them. That's, a, that's a, an argument that perhaps we can have. But another paradox, is this whole subject is full of paradoxes. Another paradox is that, is that within days of the Telegraph being exposed as coming under an absolutely, absolute influence of the uh, HSBC bank, they then publish a story ruining an absolute central paragon of the British establishment, Malcolm Rifkin, who is about as safe uh, a, 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 a political p uh, figure in the security world as you can possibly get. The same journalists who write the stories um, uh, or get their stories spiked also write stories exposing corruption. And the, uh, this is true actually right across, the, uh, right across the big media. I mean, if we think about everything we know about the world, if we were talking about the election or something, everything we know about the big parties and their leaders and, and, and their funding and everything comes to us courtesy of corporate media reporters. The reporters, the, the journalists working for mass media are struggling to maintain, and it's really an old-fashioned liberal democratic notion, um, of the social function of the journalists. Now, that, that, that notion has become completely discredited by the, by the, the stance of big media in invoking it to defend their corporate interests. So, uh, in response, for instance, to the Leveson very, very mild and weak Leveson proposals, which don't actually do put any real controls on anybody, um, the, the response of, of the corporate media who see their, a, a, a feeble challenge to their interests is that press freedom is under attack. Um, but pr uh, and the, the, they produce, I don't suppose you will see it, but we have to in our work, but the, the unbelievable stuff where they, have, they put adverts in their papers with pictures of Robert Mugabe and King Jong Un and all these all the great despots and dictators around the world comparing Lord Leveson with these with these di monstrous dictators and the, the effect one effect of this has been that the whole notion of a journalist being a person who operates uh, under an obligation to provide the uh, citizens with fair balanced accurate uh, uh, material in return for the privileges that they have. This is a theory we can go into separately. That idea has become completely discredited. But it actually is a good idea. And it is the principle on which mainstream journalists try to work and uh, well, most of them do, 90% of the time. And all local people, and I'm sure everybody here who is working for local alternative media, they are, well, it's not that they are different it is that the journalists on national media are so constrained by the circumstances that they're in. And there's, we can perhaps have time for a bit of a discussion about proposals to change that. And one of them, I said I used to work at the NUJ, is quite simply the right of journalists to be able to organise to defend themselves through their union. And there is a campaign for um, a, a, a legal measure called a conscience clause, which would mean that journalists would have a legal right to <laughs> defy uh, orders from their editors, and editors, I'm afraid, these days are just commercial managers, really, most of them. Um, the days when an editor was a respected journalist that all the others looked up to uh, and were very happy to work for, uh, uh, with, with one or two notable exceptions, have uh, of, of sadly gone. But the, the, the consequence of this is that the journalists have been put entirely on the, on the defensive. Journalism is defined now entirely in negative work terms. <coughs> All discussion of what journalists do is tainted by the corruption and the bullying and the, 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 the means that the, the corporate interests use to maintain their hold on the press. And it, 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 it's, it is really difficult for, because as you know, everybody always reads out the statistic that I think Des or Donica uh, mentioned about journalists and estate agents, and I mean these figures vary. They've been around for years, and but it does mean that, that that people don't tend to look at journalism as a positive social good. I mean this is a very 
crude idea, which, which, which to me is absolutely fundamental. I see it kind of like, uh, like medicine. I mean, if you're a doctor, <coughs> you can go and work in the refugee camps in Gaza, or you can do boob jobs in Harley Street, but you're still a doctor, and it's good that there are doctors, and if somebody falls down and has a heart attack in the street, they know what to do. Well, I mean, that's the kind of way that we look at journalism. It is the profession, as uh, Donica was saying, has been prostituted, and, the, the, and all journalists have a, have a duty to try and resist it. Uh, and part of that resistance is the work of journalists who aren't so constrained, providing the, the service to the people in their communities. So we talk a lot always about the corruption of the mass media and the five billionaires and all the rest of it, but even more damage has been done to local media. The, uh, the, there are some same and some different companies who own the chains of uh, local commercial papers which are just as monopolised as national media and the, over the last uh, 10 or 15 years they've been virtually destroyed. By, the, by, by job cuts, wage cuts, cuts in spending, because the owners of them didn't invest properly in websites and all the rest of it. I mean, I'm sure people know the story. Local papers now are an absolute shadow of what they, of what they should be, of how they should be serving the community. But the great thing is, and this is another thing, great thing about this, this, this conference, is the people who are here who are substituting for those, the, the broken down, papers and providing local papers, providing local news, mostly online. There are hundreds of local news websites now. I mean, I'm sure where I live there's a very good one, I'm sure there is everywhere. They struggle for money and there's going to be a workshop later um, about the, the ways of running and funding and running uh, local news, which, which I think is great. But as far as, the, as far as journalists are concerned, <coughs> their or our work actually lies separately from the, or, or should lie separately from the means of production that we are engaged in. Um, you resist, you, they, they, do, they have to and they do resist the uh, pressures to commercialise their work. I mean, for instance, Peter Oborn resigned, uh, and that was a huge fuss, but actually quite a lot of journalists resigned uh, on principle um, because their work is being distorted or suppressed. Um, what tends to happen is they don't make a public fuss about it. Peter Oborn can do that. He can get away with it because he's a name and he's got lots of money and he will find work. But I can think myself of half a dozen journalists who I've known who resigned from national papers in, in such protest. And at the time, as I, as I said, I was, I was working for the union and editing their paper, and in a state of great excitement, I would phone them up and say, this is brilliant stuff, this is just what we need. And without exception, they said, no, I've got to keep my head down, I need a job, I've got to, uh, I, there's someone else, you know, I've got another job, someone else will take me on. You know, there are even some liberal and progressive people at senior levels on a lot of papers. Uh, but, but they say, you know, if I go to work, I'm gonna, I've got to keep quiet can't speak about this. And all this is unknown to people. So all, all, all people know about, they know about the bad stuff that comes out. Perhaps it's up to us to publicise more of the good stuff. But what is definitely good is the work that people are doing, which they must um, exploit their ability to work without the constraints of working in corporate media. So that's what I want to say. So, should we start straight away with it? I just had an idea when you were saying that about, you know, um, if people are already researching or being handed stories from contacts, isn't there a repository we could set up that would allow mainstream journalists to anonymously post articles? They do, it's called Private Eye. <laughs> if, you, if you look at Private Eye magazine, uh, here's another, it, it, it's almost entirely filled by stories. Everybody should read Private Eye, by the way. It's all, 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 this, all the news, and it comes from journalists who've been trying to do the stories in their own papers, and they won't publish them. Or most of them can't. They do have some of their own reporters, but that's basically it's a safety valve. I mean, for example, the story about Stephen Green of HSBC, who was head of the Swiss, the Swiss private bank at the time, and all this tax fiddling, tax saving stuff was going on, and was made a, 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 a government minister in the Ministry of Department of Business. <laughs> um, that's been running in private eye for five years. 
and people in, in, in the business know it, but people outside don't. Then suddenly it breaks out when some kind of trigger makes it permissible to publish because there's some kind of scandal that meets the criteria for a scandal that can be published. So I, but that's one that, but you're quite right, there should be more, the, 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 the people here are, are, are mostly from local papers, but I mean, there is a shocking, a shocking dearth of positive, good, left-wing socialist material in Britain, not just in print, but online. I mean, if you go to America, if you, well, if you go, if you look online, there's lots of really good, really good radical uh, websites in America that, that I and other people look at. It's, I think it's terrible that the British left hasn't got, hasn't got something like that going. Should we um, get yeah. someone else to like chair or like select people? Does anyone want to do that? Or we did ask, but I'll do that. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Good. Do you want to come and see her? I, don't know, yeah. I mean, just someone who can <coughs> point at people. Yeah. I don't know. Tell people to be quiet. Well, I, think I, I don't mind just standing in the corner. No, 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 no. yeah. I, I just, just wanted to. Come see you come see here. I can see back here. Right. Sure. Just following on from what you were saying uh, regarding the Guardian, you know, this yeah. blah, blah, blah. Columbia, they've been absolutely missing the Columbia uh, coverage, which I only found out recently at the same time as the Rory Carroll. Um, the, 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 the person who's come, I, I, I mean, all, they're very bad for I, I guess he was in Iraq when he was kidnapped, and so they sent him to a soft posting. Columbia is not a soft posting. Um, and, and, and so, I, I, it'd be interesting if you, if you could talk and challenge what's going on because they actually did an advertorial yep. by the Colombian government, written by yep. the journalist. That is a clear, you know. I think they put, they do put advertising or advertorial at the top of the page. It's written by the journalist who's supposed to cover and hold them to account. Yes, that's right. That's pretty normal. <laughs> I think it's worth mentioning Scotland and um, how much the media landscape has changed there. How in a complete dearth of alternative voices, much like the rest of the UK, it is <coughs> it's leading this, these aisles in terms of like Bella Caledonia, Common Space, uh, Newsnet, Scotland, and a lot of other uh, national collective, a lot of other platforms that have developed to become the real mainstream alternative views. Or, However, you want to frame that. So yes, yeah, to, um, yeah. to respond to that and to look at like how they're leading, if you know about common space and stuff. Yeah. Well, Scotland was ratted on by murder, wasn't it? I mean, the uh, I don't suppose you the, 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 the referendum, but Alex Salmon, who was trying desperately to get into bed for years with Murdoch, on in return, obviously for the Sun, calling for a yes vote in the referendum, um, Murdoch just shut on him. But the alternative, uh, no, but just you said that there's a complete lack in this country. Yeah. There's a massive amount of alternative media up there that's really well read. But um, that's further on than say like Two Power or well, um, like yeah. America. Yeah. Yeah, from America. Oh hi. Um, my name's Charlotte. I worked uh, for mainstream media or big media, whatever you want to call it, um, in the 80s uh, for Independent Vogue and all those kind of glossy magazines and sort of Fleet Street. Um, I now run a, I'm now an alternative, as it were, uh, journalist. I just want to say uh, a couple of things. One is that um, when I was a, when I was in mainstream journalism, there is a, a core belief in most journalists that I've come across um, that you can change things from within. And I would say that most journalists I've ever met were, were, were very principled in their 20s, came with lots of fire, lots of great ideas, sometimes really brilliant writers and sometimes really brilliant editors. But they've all got this idea that one day they're going to break the system and it's going to be different. And I, and I think that's worth, one, appealing for and realising that actually that doesn't happen. You have to leave. We'll do something completely different. Um, the other thing I just want to quickly mention is that uh, we're always talking about news and these kind, of gather, these kind of gatherings or conversations, but I've been a futures journalist all my life. And that is never really approached. It's a really important part of journalism. And in fact, most of the Daily Mail is really features, masquerading as news. And, and I think to really, really look at the core problems, you know the media, you have to know what features journalism is and what power it has, and particularly to a female audience. I think don't underestimate, the Daily Mail is, is absolutely geared towards mm -hmm. women. And uh, that's not to be underestimated. Thank you.
It's entirely commercialised goods of journalism, which are yeah. largely consumer led. Yeah. You, you did have your 100% commentary originally, I don't think. So, you're yeah. sitting there, so you could probably have some. Um, yeah, okay, so I just wanted to make a little <coughs> comment yeah, following what Tim said. So, uh, I think, um, yes, we need journalists, of course, like, we need people who can find out things that are going on in the world and give us an honest account of what's going on so that we can make sense of the world, so that we can engage in politics, so that we can, so that we can do anything. Like, of course we need journalism. Like, the, I don't think anyone um, is questioning that we want people, we want to find a way of doing that. Um, I think the problem is not whether this ideal of journalism is a good thing, it's whether we start from the starting point of um, really existing journalism, if you like. The challenge is, how do we find a way of, I think, um, supporting that in the real world? How do we, given if, I, if I'm right about the extreme limitations of the corporate media and um, the lady at the front um, testifies to that, I think the challenge is, how do we get beyond simply challenging what the mainstream media are saying through comment and whatnot? And that, in reality, all of the, um, the radical voices in the uh, corporate press are comment, you know, they're commenting, they're not really producing uh, new information, they're generally not going out and reporting on the world, they're commenting on what's going on. And speaking as someone who's works in um, alternative media, that's, what, that's all we can do for the most part, is, is critique and comment. So, uh, yes, we want journalists, but the question is, how do we fund that? Because the problem is, of course, that uh, the resources the corporate media have uh, are just huge. And... Yeah, if we can't reform the, the me we can try and change the media, like these corporations themselves, and open up a bit of space within them. But ultimately, we need to find, try and find a way of think about how we're going to um, create the conditions where people can do journalism in a radically different social context. I think, and only then we'll be able to, I think, you know, have a journalism that we can really defend, which will reflect those ideals. So. I'm just wondering if you take another comment before? Or you, is it yes, um, the, 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 in a small way, uh, as I said, we, you know, there are a lot of events like this where, where <coughs> discussions of media are all critical. And sometimes I think of these things, as, apart from criticising the bad, you can praise the good. Um, and it, it is amazing the effect that it has for a journalist if they get emails and messages, that's a really good article, comments on blogs and underneath articles online. It has a fantastic event because it's such a surprise. Okay. So if you see something good, praise it. Yes. Uh, it's just a question to both of you, really. From two different sides, I think, we see you in particular, you said that you could open up spaces by whatever activities were doing towards maybe reporting you know, on online media and things like this. And you talked about the private eyes being a kind of an outlet for, for uh, journalists who had a story but couldn't get it published. Now, you said this, of course, it must have been a trigger that allowed mm. that story to have a break in the end. But it seems it's to me as yeah. if the trigger might have just been some, somebody's interests, some kind of interest in actually letting that out. Is there a, a possibility that a trigger might become the fact that? about the conspiracy, but I mean, it was just Peter Oberlin that brought out the HSBC. It's a house at three o'clock in the conspiracy. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I don't want to talk about, I'm really honest, I'm trying to see whether, you know, I mean, we've seen like, years and years ago, the intermediate and things like that. Yeah, it's still going. Yeah, but to me, it was really big for a certain yeah, time. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Maybe because there's more now, but I think it was pretty niche. Like well, yeah, I mean, it is unfortunate. Private Eye is, is a very metropolitan uh, and actually an elite publication. It's, yeah. read by, it's read by a lot of people, but they're all elite people. Yeah, yeah and that was, that was something I was going to bring up earlier, actually. Yeah. Um, 
And I, I, just before you share this point, uh, I, I think that um, saying about switching, you know, like if journalists, I mean, it's a temptation that all journalists leave mainstream publications and join alternative, but then how are the, I think as you've been mentioning, how are people going to find alternative news because they're so used to getting it fed to them? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Dave Toomer, um, I used to work in newspapers, I worked for a local newspaper called uh, Media News, so I was sacked for being a trade unionist, um, and then I feel like a bit now I'm, I'm, I'm a teacher and I want to pick up the point that uh, Tim raised about local media, so I think that's really, really important, so a lot about big media, about the, the top, the top uh, four or five or whatever in, in, in national media. Uh, local media is controlled by four, essentially by four big companies. And uh, it's been destroyed, it's been destroyed by um, corporate interests, it's been destroyed by these companies which sought in, in, a, in the heyday uh, to get uh, returns of like 30 odd percent on their investment and stuff like that. And now we're in a position where it's, it's a discussion about radical journalists uh, in mainstream media. It's becoming a radical act to be a local newspaper journalist. A journalist because they're disappearing, they're all, they're all going. Uh, you look at what's happening just in Greater Manchester, uh, where over the, the, there's no newspaper in, in uh, within Shaw and South Manchester. Uh, there was a, there's a couple of newspapers in the north of Manchester, North East Manchester Advertiser, Salford Advertiser, um, and, and other newspapers further out in, in, in Greater Manchester. And just recently, uh, they've announced that they're going to, well, they shut the North East Manchester Advertiser some time ago. They're going to close the Salford uh, Advertiser, which will mean there's no weekly newspapers in the whole of North Manchester. And there's this idea, uh, turning the Trinity Mirror, that uh, with a digital revolution, we're going to change everything, everything is going to be digital and stuff like that. And I'm really quite concerned about that from a, a mainstream journalist point of view. Uh, I'm really con concerned because. Most of the, of the traffic, this is what Trinity Mirror tells me, uh, to their uh, website comes from social media, comes from Facebook. Uh, and I, I, I visited the, uh, the MEN uh, newsroom recently and there was a chat to uh, one of the uh, editors there and she said, oh, I don't know what we'd do if Facebook changed their algorithm and we didn't get uh, 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 references from uh, Facebook to, 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 to uh, our site, we'd lose all our traffic. I'm thinking, yeah, uh, it, it is a bit of a concern, that, isn't it? But what happens if Facebook goes bust? You know, they've got all, all this, this idea. And, and I think one of the crucial issues here is it all boils down to ownership. And we've been talking about that in, in, in the main session. And that's what links the, the issue of uh, national newspapers and local newspapers. It all, it all boils down to the corporate interests of a handful of companies uh, that have sucked uh, the, 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 the lifeblood out of the media and are now just trying to extract as much profit as they can in whatever way that they can. It doesn't matter that poor communities like Salford, North East Manchester are left without a printed newspaper and they have to uh, be able to, to get online if they can and then if they do, uh, the, 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 the uh, information is competing with information and news from other uh, communities uh, around uh, Greater Manchester and of course this is a uh, this is a story which can be retold in every uh, major kind of Asian city. Yeah, do you guys want to come back on that? Or? Can I ask you a quick question? Just, yeah, I'm sorry, it's really you, really can, you can have to, this lady here, because she's been waiting. Uh, yeah, I just want to go back to Tim's original point about radical journalism, like Aaron Sherman mentioned. Personally, I think one of the big problems is the kind of narrow agreement with social and economic background. That, in a way, means that they actually can't be radical. I mean, I work with prisoners, um, they don't know that they're journalists, they don't really want to argue. So, uh, only journalists is quite a problem with political parties, and they come up here. And I think that kind of, um, you know, there's a real gentrification of the left going on at the moment, and I think that includes journalism, and I think that's a big problem, because it's only people who are trying to be educated off of this background, and sort of doing internships, you know, um, kind of apprenticeship support, is that a word, that means that you get those kind of jobs. And then I think because there's that shared world view that comes from coming from that background, actually that means a lot of things that need to be discussed, don't get on the agenda. Yeah. So you want to start that one?
Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely right. I mean, as Samantha mentioned this morning, the actual drop in the number of uh, black journalists in, in the community. But the main, the, the main change has been that journalists now have to be rich because since uh, uh, journalist training... There was a question about this that wasn't time to answer in the first session. Uh, journalist training has become uh, entirely now a, a university uh, thing. They, they, they've stopped, they used to have a sort of apprentice system. Therefore, you've got to not only be able to go through college, you've also got to work, do unpaid labour as what they're now calling an intern. Or the, the, the abuse of the work experience system to pick people off for nothing, spit them out if they don't like them, is criminal. Uh, and although, the, I mean, there is, there is a, a, a political organisation against that, which even the Labour Party uh, is opposing, but it is such a, the system is so rife. The, the other thing I wanted to mention, just quickly, as, as, to, as to what Dave said about local papers, there is a proposal um, which we, we're actually advancing, I'm from the Campaign for Progressive Broadcasting Freedom, and we're currently preparing a thing called the Media Manifesto for the election, and there is a proposal that local paper titles could be declared um, a public asset, and by law, the owners of papers, because lots of papers have been closing all over the country, could be prevented from closure, and the owners compelled to sell the title to some other local interest if one can be found. Um, that, that, that is something that might help. That's one of our proposals for the election. Okay, so did you want to come on the same point? Yeah, I just wanted to um, pick up on that point about backgrounds of journalists, because I, I think when I was talking, I mentioned I didn't think that journalists were generally sort of inclined to be critical anyway. I didn't, that wasn't meant as any kind of slur. I just think that that's the reality um, that people's ideas about the world and people's like, you know, ideas when they go into journalism, it's not just the institutions, the, you know, the companies themselves. Like These are real people who have had lots of real experiences outside of journalism. People bring that whole worldview with them. And I think, um, you know, if you look at... There was that social mobility report out last year and it talked about the social and educational backgrounds of everyone and their... You know, their backgrounds were exactly the same as all the other British elites. So you had the, the politicians, the barristers, the, the judges, and the journalists. You know, most of them went to public school, most of them went to Oxbridge. Um, so, you know, it's not just the media. I mean, this is a wider network of privilege and power that, that operates within the media um, and can be, can be looked at narrowly, but also it's, it's much broader than that. And, um, you know, for every Oborn, you know, Oborn's a very unusual character in that he takes his profession, professional ideology and he's got, very seriously, he's got a lot of um, integrity. So, you know, look at someone like Andrew Gilligan. He was a Telegraph journalist. He got fired from the BBC. And what's he doing now? Writing about, you know, Britain's Muslim problem. So, and he's... Well, he's with Boris Johnson. Yeah, but, you know, he, he, that, you know, it's not like yeah. he's brainwashed just because of his, like, working circumstances. Yeah. You know, journalists are free people as well. So... Um, yeah. If it's quick, yeah. I just, I just, the, the idea of a shared worldview, I remember when the Independent ran with an editorial that called Chavez the Dictator, Julio Chavez the Dictator, and I actually tweeted there and Joan and said to you, you were with the idiot at the time, do you think you should actually say something about that? He was absolutely aghast at the idea of um, criticising his employer, and then had his, um, 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 Mehdi Hassan came on and said, oh, it's absurd to ask him to criticise his employer. Yeah. So I just wonder what that word radical means or alternative means when it's being applied to journalists yeah, I mean, it's to their employment. And their I think that's right, you know, it's very I clear that... Is system going on <laughs> yeah, I, I think I was going to say, because this guy's had sorry, a sorry. Yeah, while, right. I didn't think that was just going to be a reply rather than another question, so... Okay, so uh, this question to come back to Dave, because it links up this idea of ownership and where it's worth, like, say, young people and people who've got, like, um, a choice ahead of them in this room, invest in their time and effort, is it worth the time and money going down the traditional, and this is a simple question, but we're giving time stuff because you've got experience of both, time and energy going down traditional journalism school, getting into the media and being right within that establishment, or is it worth building up a platform that you've got ownership over, and spending your time and money doing that is kind of more control. So, because you've got a perspective from both, you just want to find out if you've any thoughts on that. Um, I'm not sure that, the, the, that you have uh, complete control, even if you're talking about setting up your own 
sites and stuff like that. I'm not sure you have complete control because, well, first of all, you look at most hyperlocal websites, for example. Uh, well, a, a lot of hyperlocal websites, as Tim said, uh, struggle for, uh, for money. You look at uh, things like Pits and Pots, very good hyperlocal site in, in Staffordshire, it closed because it lost funding. But sustainability of um, hyperlocal media and independent media is, is a huge issue. So, so I'm, I'm not sure that, that, that there is a, uh, a clear choice between um, sending my students who I teach into either mainstream journalism. Yeah, I, I, I'd like all my students to get jobs in, in so-called mainstream big media, whatever you want to call it. I'd like them to, to get jobs and to, uh, to make a difference. And hopefully, hopefully, some of the things I say to them, some of the more radical things that I say to them, sinks in and, 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 and has an effect. I don't know whether it's a good idea to, uh, to uh, push them down that route or uh, another route and say set up your own organisation. Um, maybe we can have a bit of both, but uh, I, I, think, I think that the issue is uh, the political and economic system that we're under uh, at the moment uh, makes it very difficult for hope to uh, flourish. I think that that, that is a, a, a problem. I think some of the uh, sort of solutions that have been put forward, like um, um, community assets and um, funding for these organisations uh, is a start, but I think we need fundamental change, not just in the media, not just in the, media, but in the way uh, society is all Okay, thanks. Can I have a here? Yeah, I was just going to ask, um, it's a two-part question. Um, do you think journalism is like now elitist? And um, also, like, um, on Freeview, you've got BBC, RT, Al Jazeera, Sky, do you think anyway you've got alternative voices can penetrate, like, um, TV news, since we're dominated by right-wing channels? Um... Yeah, I mean, I've, if you were asking me, I, I think journalism is elitist, but I know I've already said that. But um, television is something I know a bit more about than print media because I've spent a long time researching the BBC. And during the same period where these kind of changes have happened with the press in terms of like consolidation, in terms of the instrumentalisation of news through corporate communications and PR and all the rest of it, um, the BBC has gone through a, process, a similar process of change. So when it was initially attacked quite ferociously by Thatcher in the 1980s, and then in the 1990s, uh, it had a director general called John Burt, who was quite committed neoliberal. He uh, was friends with Peter Jay, who was quite an influential monetarist at the, at the times. And um, he introduced a, a whole system there, which was uh, called Producer Choice, which was basically a way of making the BBC more business orientated, and it, and it became hugely, um, it's journalism as well, particularly under Dyke, it's very explicitly said we need to be more interested in business, and they put huge amounts of resources into that, and at the same time, um, journalists whose kind of uh, beat was to do with the trade unions um, just disappeared, so uh, the BBC, you know, you see it now, if they report any economic issue, there's no conception for them, I think, that business and the economy a distinct things, i.e. The, the business of a particular kind of interest. And I think, so I think the process that's taken place at the BBC has definitely shifted to the right. Um, and, you know, those other um, companies, I think, you know, have the same corporate problems which, which the press have had. So I, th I think, you know, the television is the same problem. But Des mentioned earlier, you know, that there, are, there is a different regulatory regime in place with television and the media. So they're, they're different problems. So, uh, you know, the press can sort of be as politically partisan as they like, but there are restraints on television that still are, I think, worth defending, and uh, that's why Sky aren't as crazy as you think, you know, you might expect them to be, right? So they're not Fox. We've got our team, which is the Fox solution. Yeah, I mean, there are other media, aren't there? So, and they obviously come with their own particular gender and political culture and all the rest of it. I guess if we're all, you know, if you a starting point is knowing the media and knowing how we navigate these things and how we recognise interests and so yeah and that's why it's important I think that everyone Thanks. understands these things I was just wondering you, did you have did you have a response about no, just, just, uh, to this lady about how, how how we can make new media outlets I think that was that was well as far as the point on free view is concerned though all, all, all the station to, to, to broadcast on TV or even online you on TV you have to you have to have a licence from off so you have to be 
a very big, quite a big, rich company to do that. You know, it's like the old thing, Britain with complete press freedom. Anybody can start a newspaper or, or anything else. But all you need is 500 million pounds. I mean, that's what it comes down to. Okay, so now, did you have a question as well? <coughs> yeah. You had your hand um, earlier. It was about the kind of, uh, like, the implication of journalism in it. I mean, I've noticed that you and a lot of stories are more about sort of things that are on Tumblr and BuzzFeed and stuff rather than, you know, any sort of hard-hitting radical agenda or what have you. And, you know, headlines um, are about sort of generating click throughs to the article by having those kind of, you know, 12 things you'd never have guessed about whatever, like this really sort of... About this kind of article. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's, that's it's right, kind of, yeah. Like, how do we sort of, in the, like, journalism climate where that's how yeah. stories seem to be, they're, they're the ones that are getting read, how do we put a sort of radical agenda forward? Can I find a way to write it the way they think, write it? I just wanted to say, we've only got four minutes left, I think, until we've got to clear the room. So, I'm just saying, there's three questions about waiting. That story about the gold and white dress, and the two about that was purposely put out there just as a distraction. It's just a dumb story, isn't it? It was picked up as a distraction, but yeah. Do you know that, uh, sorry, do, do, very quickly, do you know that the BBC radio a PM programme yesterday had 10 minutes on that dress? Which nobody could see because they were listening to the radio. They're so funny. What was it that Samantha called it? The okay. Ninja Turtle syndrome. I all did the same story. Ten minutes of radio about it. I think now because we've got, I've got, I've got three questions waiting, but I don't think we're going to have time to answer those. Of course, I don't know whether you guys just want to give the questions and then you, you, you two can just come back. Well, with people something. can talk to us outside, I guess. This is story. Okay. Yeah. So. You had something and you had something, so do you want to just, quick, just quickly, let's have your question. Let's, let's go to and drag his hand. <laughs> so just come, come with your question. I recently saw the movie One Road Reporter. Uh, I, hope, I don't know how many of us have seen this. One Road Reporter by Rich uh, Pepia. One Road Pepia. Yeah. Oh yes, I have. Yes, uh, Rich Pepe, actually. Yeah. He's another one. You see, he he, he, was, he was just an ordinary right wing journalist, and he just he said, "I've had enough. I've had enough to hear." And he, he, if anyone could see the film, it's brilliant. Yeah. Okay, good. That's a good suggestion. Let's have you because you also had your hand up. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. We, we really are running out of time, and I'm sure they're all going to kick us out shortly. So, yeah. Yeah. definition definition of radical is to cut out of the reach. Isn't it? So it seems to me. If you want to be radical, you want to cut it to loose, but you want to live off the street okay? on the same tree, it's not going to work. Mm. Yeah. The reason the change is to cut the tree down, so you'd have to plant new farm. I think the internet, I, mean, I don't mind, I don't buy the paper anymore. I'm sure I've never read the paper. I haven't bought the paper for five years at least. Mm. You know what you want to do, there's new forms, and there's new forms of fun that are available, isn't it? And you just... Like crowdfunding or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. the internet's open at all ups, but the old forms, to be radical, Unless you mean to chop it out. Yeah, right. Before you guys get back, ladies. It's just a really quick question. Um, I'm a photojournalist and I've been covering protests and demonstrations around the UK for this is my fifth year. And I have a Facebook page and that's where I put all my stuff out there. And there's nearly 3,000 people on that. Mm. And I tried to take it off Facebook the other day because I feel that it's very restrictive. Um, and nobody followed me to my Flickr page or to try and get try, oh, nobody. Um, so I reopened the page again, and suddenly people started to like the page again. And sometimes I can have a reach of 80,000 people on that page. And I would like to see Facebook, um, people coming off Facebook, and re like you're saying, rebuilding a network that's not linked yeah. to, because okay. I consider that to be that, big media. And can I just I put my own quick last quick comment, which is I just, I, I think what I'm aware of is that a lot of this new radical journalism is going online, but then, as, as I think Dave was sort of intimating as well, that you know, who, there's a lot of there's a, there's a digital underclass that don't have access to online resources and that don't have that so aren't going to get, and they're often the people that these stories are actually about or focusing on that you know don't get to read about themselves. Years working on a film festival in Salford, where which one of the biggest the biggest problems we had was that because they were getting funding from the city council, city council wants to be open online, and I'm sitting there and look, we ain't got computers. What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. They ain't got computers, you ain't communicating to those people. The people who trying to reach, they want to, get, they want to go to a computer, they've got a library of fire on them, right on the computer access. Yeah. There's no, it's, it's, not, it's not that which, easy. Which is where things like local newspapers and, also, and local radio are going. I think we're going to have to... Uh, well, so thank you very much, everybody. Yeah, thank you very much, everybody.
was hoping to give you guys a last one. No, I'm sorry. No, we didn't want to.